So hello everybody, this is Bhante Joe here, and I'm just here at the uh, large rock behind the Papatakuti and thought to record a short Dhamma discussion for the internet. So I thought that maybe we could start with a little meditation so we can lean forward a bit and arch the spine and look about three feet in front and close our eyes. And can focus in on the breath. Can know when it's coming in and know when it's going out. And can focus in on the breath. Can know when it's coming in and know when it's going out. If we breathe in a long breath, can just know I'm breathing in a long breath. <clears throat> and if we breathe in a short breath, can just know I'm breathing in a short breath. And can focus in on the breath at the tip of the nose. And when watching the breath at the tip of the nose, can try to make mindfulness as continuous as possible. Being aware all the way through the in-breath. <clears throat> as the in-breath turns to the out-breath, all the way through the out-breath and as the out-breath turns to the in-breath again. Trying to keep mindfulness as continuous as possible. And when watching the breath, you can try to make one's mind like a post in the sea. And just like waves come and crash over the post, the post doesn't move. So too, one can try to make the mind stable, just watching the breath as it comes in and watching the breath as it goes out. And before we finish meditating, can spread thoughts of goodwill, <coughs> wishing may all beings all around everywhere be happy and at ease. May they put in place the causes necessary to be happy and at ease. 
and we can make the mind infinite can make it unbounded all the way to the ends of the universe and beyond in every dimension may all beings all around everywhere be happy and at ease And can open our eyes and do a short Dhamma discussion for the internet. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Buddhang sarananga chami dhammang sarananga chami sangang sarananga chami Dityampi buddhang sarananga chami dityampi dhammang sarananga chami dityampi sangang sarananga chami Tatiampi buddhang sarananga chami tatiampi dhammang sarananga chami tatiampi sangang sarananga chami so hope that everybody's keeping well wherever it might be and was uh, chatting with uh, with somebody um, kind of messaging I guess better word and uh, the conversation was actually really interesting they brought up some really interesting good points and so I thought to basically generalize um, one of the points from from the conversation it wasn't really uh, it wasn't really like a question per se it was part of like a larger discussion but just extrapolating from that um, from that discussion, it was basically one one uh, of the issues that got brought up was the um, was this issue of kind of there's things that the Thai forest what they call Kruba Ajans the 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 masters of the Thai forest tradition where they describe about jhanas and some of the ways that they describe the their experience of the final goal. Is, uh, is people have trouble um, linking it up with the suttas. And so I uh, thought to basically uh, do a discussion on that, hopefully to provide some clarification. Um, so this, this Dhamma discussion, kind of a, a warning, it, it might be a little bit academic. <laughs> so <laughs> um, it might be most useful for people who are interested in the Thai forest tradition, have faith in the practices of the Thai forest tradition, but also have faith in the suttas and want to mesh those two together. Other than that, it might be a little bit uh, technical and <laughs> wordy with the suttas. So anyways, that's a warning. So uh, if uh, you still might like to listen, then feel welcome to stick around. Just have to pass that along just in case. And so in the Thai forest tradition, um, the two there's there's a, a bunch of different I guess you'd say like uh, controversies or um, things where people who mainly come at the Buddhist doctrine from a sutta angle uh, where they have trouble linking the suttas with some of the things that the ajans describe. So here in this discussion, we'll just focus on the two main ones that are practical. Is kind of one is the um, the description of the jhanas in the Thai forest tradition and uh, the importance that they give to the jhanas. And the other one is their description of uh, the achievement of the final goal. The, often the, the Kruba Ajans, the masters of the Thai forest tradition, will describe this in terms of like a kind of consciousness, like a, sometimes they use the word like deathless consciousness. So those two issues are the ones that that, that might try to discuss uh, today. So for the, for the, if one reads books like Patipada or the biography of Ajahn Man or listens to talks from, I guess you say like the first generation of Ajahns coming after Ajahn Man, they emphasize very strongly uh, concentration. They emphasize this state of concentration where one 
is basically practicing uh, mindfulness or so and you know is getting uh, more and more deep into the concentration and suddenly there's this point where or there's a point where one kind of uh, they call it reaches the base of apana samadhi fixed samadhi this kind of samadhi where one basically uh, the mind almost sounds like descends and uh, the awareness of the body awareness of sounds and sights these things are lost and one stays in there for a period of time and then emerges and this is seen to be something really excellent in the Thai forest tradition. Actually, if one goes and trains and stays in uh, traditional Thai forest tradition monasteries in Thailand, then the main emphasis is basically to cultivate this type of samadhi before, uh, before trying to do a contemplation, like body contemplation. It's kind of the, the main emphasis is on kind of cultivating this type of samadhi and then using it to examine the body and then uh, that can be used all the way up to non-return and then using uh, examining sankharas or whatever it is that one might need to examine uh, after that the impermanence of sankharas and feelings and these kind of things. So one of the things is that in the suttas, when one reads through the suttas, it usually describes the, the four jhanas in terms of like uh, states that are very pleasant that one can basically spread the feeling of that jhana throughout one's body and uh, and it's kind of uh, it's something that does not sound like a lock like a state that's fixed or apana or locked in or one where one can't hear sounds or see sights it's the one where one is actively and aware spreading uh, feelings throughout the body through all the four jhanas and these are defined as sama samadhi in the uh, noble eightfold path so interestingly enough when we look through the the canon actually there's uh, there's many, the Buddha describes many different, um, describes different kinds of samadhi and different types of uh, concentration. Um, but uh, the four jhanas are the main ones. So sometimes he describes, just an example, he describes like the themeless concentration and there's suttas which describe that. It describes uh, abiding and emptiness as a meditative dwelling. And there's, there's other ones uh, as well. But uh, in addition, the four form, the, uh, the formless ayatanas. But uh, there is this also this type of concentration where the Buddha described, which is called uh, the imperturbable concentration. And so this kind of concentration, it, it, it shows up in the Udana, and uh, it also shows up in, th I think, three suttas, and two, two suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya, MN66, and another one I can't remember now, but I'll plan to try to put the links at the bottom of the description. And it also shows up in the Anguttara Nikaya. So this type of imperturbable concentration, this is a kind of concentration where it sounds very similar to what the Thai Kruba Ajans are describing, where one's basically unaware of sights or sounds. So in the, in the Sutta and the Udana, uh, there's several monks um, who are very noisy and they, the Buddha sends them away and they go away. And then they, they dwell uh, basically speaking to each other very little and practicing a lot of meditation. And dwelling this way, they all become arahants, basically, as far as I remember. And then they disappear and reappear in front of the Buddha. And they and all the Buddha enter into imperturbable concentration, as far as I remember the sutta. Then An Venerable Ananda tries to rouse, talk to the Buddha, and the Buddha doesn't respond. And then when, the, when a certain period of time has passed, then the Buddha says, you wouldn't have even tried to talk to us if you'd, if you'd known that we were all in the imperturbable concentration. So this is this kind of uh, concentration that sounds very similar to the Thai forest tradition definition of the imperturbable concentration. So interestingly enough, in the Majjhima Nikaya, you've got this one sutta, MN66, which describes um, all these various jhanas as being perturbable, 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 or pertaining to the perturbable, and then the fourth jhana as pertaining to the imperturbable. So here it sounds like the fourth jhana is something that can be included under the imperturbable concentration, possibly. Then you have another sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, and it sounds like it includes uh, basically just uh, the first two formless states. And uh, the last two are not explicitly excluded in the, from, the, from the imperturbable. Then you've got a sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, and it explicitly excludes the fourth jhana and includes all four formless states under the imperturbable. <laughs> so we have these three suttas that seem to give slightly different definitions for what the imperturbable is. So 
Basically, uh, there's other suttas as well where the Buddha seems to enter into imp imperturbable concentration. There's, uh, or there's at least one other sutta. There's one where the Alara Kalama enters into something that sounds like this, and uh, 500 carts pass him by. He can't hear the carts, and then the Buddha says, "Well, if if you, you know, basically, I entered into the imperturbable concentration. He doesn't use that word, I don't think, but." in an even more extreme situation where there was like a thunderstorm and people got murdered and he, he didn't even notice it because he was in the state of concentration. So, uh, so this imperturbable concentration, the suttas are not 100% clear, but it could be fourth jhana or any of the four formless attainments uh, based on just the suttas. Now in the Thai forest tradition, most often the forest ajans don't classify jhanas. They don't say um, if somebody goes to them, they don't say, you've hit this jhana, you've hit that jhana, typically. The Thai forest tradition is very practice-oriented, so what, what the ajans will tend to do is, if one goes and uh, describes what one's meditation is like, they'll try, to dis they'll try to say what to do to make it better, or to do to change it, to, to stop bad things from happening. Basically try to improve one's meditation. They don't usually like to put labels on these things. So for this reason, we don't usually have uh, the Thai Kruba Ajans describing uh, the states that they're talking about as, okay, this is this jhana, or that jhana, or that jhana, or that jhana. Uh, it's more like a practical interaction between student and teacher. However, Ajahn Suchart, he does, I guess he speaks, uh, Venerable Ajahn Suchart speaks English, and uh, probably has been asked the question many times by English speakers or possibly Westerners, uh, what does this state belong to that the Krubhajans are talking about? And he classifies it under the fourth jhana. He thinks it's the fourth jhana, this kind of state where one is kind of uh, locked in or fixed. Now, there's, it's important to make a distinction here, too, because the Thai Krubhajans recommend basically two types of states that can be locked in or fixed. One is this apana samadhi, which is a good thing, and another one is what they call asanyi, it's kind of, it's just briefly mentioned in the suttas, there's this realm of non-percipient beings where they don't, they don't have any perception at all. And uh, this, the kama that's supposed to lead to that is the cultivation of this asanyi. And so there's, a, there's an article that Ajahn Tanisro wrote for Tricycle years back where he described how he would, uh, one day coming back and meditating, he basically entered into this asanyi and found that he, uh, over the subsequent days, he was able to basically program himself to come in and out of it. Uh, whenever he likes. He could say, you know, he could say, like, I'll meditate for two hours and 12 minutes, and he would come out for <laughs> two hours and 12 minutes later, and it would seem like only five minutes had passed. And so he went and reported this to his teacher, Ajahn Fung, and Ajahn Fung said, do you like it? And Ajahn Tanisro said, no. And Ajahn Fung said, okay, good, well, that means you're safe, because some people think that it's Nibbana. Um, but it's basically just this non-percipient state, which is not seen as a good thing necessarily. He said, but Ajahn Fung said it does have its uses. When he was undergoing surgery and didn't trust the anesthesiologist, he, uh, he, he basically put himself into that state so that if the, if the anesthesia didn't work, then he wouldn't be in pain from the surgery. <clears throat> so this Asanyi is not necessarily seen as a good state, not one that leads to wisdom. This uh, apana samadhi is. And Ajahn Suchart classifies that under the fourth jhana. Now, these uh, imperturbable states, in the canon under Parajika 2, these references to the imperturbable are scattered throughout the canon. Under Parajika 2, there's a Mah Venerable Mahamogalyana describes this time when he's like at the banks of a river and he enters into the imper imperturbable concentration, but he hears uh, Nagas plunging in and out of the river and he hears a heron's call. And the monks criticize him and say, well, how could you hear that if you're in the imperturbable concentration? And they report this to the Buddha and the Buddha says, well, there is that variety of con imperturbable concentration, but it's not totally pure. So in other words, there one can kind of imagine it as like a kind of gradation where there's the, the classic standard formula for the imperturbable concentration, fourth jhana up to the uh, formless states, possibly, uh, if we put all the suttas together. I mean, there could be different ways to interpret that. And if one cultivates it to a very high degree, then one can enter into this fixed uh, apana, a, apana samadhi. Uh, um, uh, 
Uh, and if one doesn't cultivate it to a very high degree, then one can enter into what they call in the suttas or the vinaya, this impure, imperturbable concentration. One can have the fourth jhana and not be totally fixed in there. So the, the Kuba Ajans um, recognize this kind of op, this uh, fixed concentration as something very good, this imperturbable concentration is something very good, because what they describe is that when one comes from that imperturbable concentration, one's mindfulness is extremely sharp. And they say this is the right time to cultivate wisdom topics. Now, interestingly, if we look into the suttas in the Diganikaya and other suttas that describe when a bhikkhu attains psychic powers, they say he makes his mind uh, compliant, malleable, wieldly, and Im- attained to imperturbability. It's kind of the last uh, section. I don't remember exactly, but basically that's the standard. The last one is attained to imperturbability. So. And then it says he directs his mind to the divine eye, he, these kind of things. He directs his mind to the divine ear. He directs his mind to having the manifold psychic powers. You know, having become one, having been one, he becomes many, these kind of things. And then at the end it says he directs his mind to the destruction of the taints. This kind of, so, uh, <clears throat> so this actually, this description, this standard description in the suttas, mirrors the practice of the Thai forest Kruba Ajans <clears throat> in that... <clears throat> Uh, one makes the mind uh, malleable, compliant, or pliant, and attain to imperturbability. And after that, one directs the mind to uh, the destruction of the taints, or in this case, to these wisdom topics that, uh, that lead to the destruction of the taints. So, <clears throat> from this perspective, one can take what the Thai Kruba Ajans are describing and assign it to this imperturbable concentration, this kind of concentration where one is fixed but also very, very mindful, not the type of concentration that's a sanyi where one enters into it and it's just like a blank out. <laughs> it's kind of five minutes, pa- three hours pass, it seems like five minutes, one doesn't know what happened at all, and one's mindfulness isn't any, necessarily any sharper on emerging from it. It's just kind of one is, uh, one is uh, groggy, according to Ajahn Tanisro's description. So one can uh, understand the description of the Kruba Ajans and the description in the suttas is meshing and uh, not, not, not being apart, uh, being complementary. And so the second um, controversial uh, topic that often comes up is when the Thai Kruba Ajans talk about the attainment of Nibbana, they often describe it as like a type of consciousness. Some of them will use this word like Amata Chitta, or the deathless Chitta, or sometimes they use the word like the primal mind to describe uh, Nibbana as a synonym for Nibbana. And so there's quite a lot of objection to this because in the suttas it seems that the Buddha is always talking about consciousness as something impermanent. It's kind of even a sutta where, the, where there's uh, a monk who says that it's the same consciousness that wanders on and the Buddha, he doesn't relinquish that view. The Buddha really castigates him. So there's many, many suttas in the, in the canon which, uh, which make clear that consciousness, that consciousness is not... Uh, is, is basically uh, an aggregate. It's part of the five aggregates. So how could, uh, how could Nibbana be described as, uh, as a type of consciousness? So interestingly enough, in the suttas, there's two different suttas which describe basically like a, the consciousness of an arahant. One is uh, Digha Nikaya 11, I think, the Kevada Sutta. And here the Buddha describes a type of consciousness that nothing sticks to. It's called Anidasana Vinyana. It's kind of uh, Ajahn Tanisaru, I think, translates that as uh, surfaceless consciousness, or consciousness without feature. And uh, basically, this is a type of consciousness where uh, the things that uh, impact it, they don't stick to it. It's kind of a little bit paradoxical. There's another sutta called Majjhima Nikaya 49, or in Majjhima Nikaya 49, where the Buddha rebukes Brahma, goes up and argues with the Brahma, and I think in that sutta, um, I think that may be the sutta where the Brahma, uh, the Brahma uh, says that he's going to disappear from the Buddha, and the Buddha says, well, disappear from me if you can, and he can't do it. And then the Buddha, he, the Brahma says, okay, well, you disappear from me if you can, and the Buddha does. <laughs> And he, he, has a, he creates a feat of psychic power so that he only, only his voice can be heard, but he can't be seen. So what this means is that the Buddha uh, had attained to a level that's more subtle, that's, more, um, uh, uh, that's less conditioned, I guess one could say, <laughs> than, the, than what the Brahma had attained to. The Brahma could not find, he didn't know about the level that the Buddha had uh, reached. And so after doing that, the Buddha recites these verses where he describes... 
anidasana vijnana, this consciousness without feature, as not being known through the earthness of earth, the wateriness of water, the fieriness of fire, the windiness of wind, or the allness of the all. It's basically that windy and the, basically the four elements, more or less, paraphrasing that, but he said he goes through the four elements, and then he says it's not known through the allness of the all. So it's basically not known through sangsara. So this pretty much makes it clear, more or less, that or it's a very strong point anyway, that uh, this anidasana vijnana can be equated with nibbana. Also in the Samyutta Nikaya, there's a group of Samyuttas on the, the unconditioned. And there's one Samyutta where the Buddha goes, I'll teach you the, uh, basically the path to nibbana. He gives all these different... Uh, gives all these different similes for Nibbana, like the island, I think, the highest happiness, the harbor. And one of those is the featureless, the Anidasana. He basically lists that in there with the synonyms for Nibbana. So that is another extremely strong point, that this Anidasana Vijnana is basically a synonym for Nibbana. So what we have is a type of consciousness, the Buddha describing a type of consciousness that doesn't seem to come under the consciousness aggregate. And that's pretty much all that one can say about it. There's another sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya where, uh, where there's a description of what happens, like how consciousness works, so when, like when a light hits a, how consciousness uh, falls or basically has a surface to reflect off of, more or less. It says, if a light goes and hits a wall, uh, if a light uh, goes to land, basically where does it land? It lands on the wall, more or less. If it, if it, uh, if it doesn't land on the wall, where does it land? Well, it lands on the ground. And if it doesn't land on the ground, where does it land? Well, it lands on water. And if it doesn't land on water, where does it land? It doesn't land. <laughs> so this is a kind of uh, description, taken as a kind of description for a kind of consciousness that doesn't land anywhere. It's, it's basically unmanifested. So there's another sutta where the Buddha describes, uh, he basically is giving a simile for an arahant. It's where the, the word nibbana comes from. He says, you know, if, what, do you, what happens when a fire to a fire, you know, when a fire is uh, is burning, you can basically classify it as these different types of fires, more or less, just paraphrasing here. And when it's gone out, how can you classify it? You can't classify it. It's basically just classified as out, nibbana, more or less. But the Vedic definition of fire differs from our own definition in the modern day. In the modern day, fire basically extinguished. It's obliterated. But in the Vedic definition, fire was this kind of um, thing that... Uh, would latch on to its fuel. It was, kind of, it, was, it was something that was kind of seen as latent, more or less, throughout the, uh, throughout the atmosphere or throughout the world, but not manifested until it latched on to something. And when it latched on to something, then it manifests. So we have these kind of descriptions of a consciousness that doesn't manifest, a consciousness without feature, a consciousness that's beyond the all. And uh, in the Samyutta Nikaya, this Anidasana is being equivalent to Nibbana. So one doesn't necessarily have to see that as being separate from the descriptions of the Thai Kruba Ajans, of like a deathless chitta or, or something like this. There's also these sometimes cryptic phrases in the Pali of the Sutta Pitaka, where it's like, asawe hi chittani vimuching suti. Their, their chittas were freed from the asavas. <laughs> the chittas were freed from the asavas. But there's also, anyways, these things go back and forth. So, so, Basically, though, it's not something when one listens to the way that the Krubhajans describe this, it's not a type of consciousness that's equivalent with like the, the usual knower. So in his book, Arhatamaga Arhatapala, also in Ajahn Dan's biography, also there's a description with uh, Venerable Ajahn Cha where, uh, where he, he basically has this, this talk which is titled, The Knower Can Change. And in all these talks and descriptions, they make it clear that one has to go beyond the knower. It's kind of this normal vinyana kanda. Actually, Longta Mahabua in his book Arhatamaga Arhatapala describes that when a, when a person has basically cut off all the other outlets for their defilements, then all those defilements can gather into a central point in the mind that's this extremely beautiful and mesmerizing radiance, which is just overpowering and very stunning. And he says this radiance is actually nothing other than a vija. He says this is why the Buddha says that the mind is radiant, but he doesn't say that the mind is pure. And it's only when one sees the kind of flaws in this radiance that there's still the kind of maintenance needed for it, and there's a fear around losing it, that one can go beyond it to something that's truly unconditioned. And what he says is that you can't describe it. You can't really describe what that is at all. 
and similar with basically almost all the uh, what all, almost all the crew bhajans say, but it's basically something beyond description. This also matches um, what we find in the canon. So although there is this kind of like one word synonyms for it, one of which is a type of consciousness, there's, there's almost nothing that one can say about it. It's something that doesn't matter. There's nothing that reflects off of it. There's, there's nothing that one can say. So uh, uh, although if one tries to put a word to it, they can sometimes put like a word like a deathless chitta or something, but then try to describe it, it doesn't work. So this is, this is why, this is in the canon, we also have these descriptions in the suttas where people ask, you know, do the Tagata exist, both exist, not exist, neither exist after death, and these kind of things. The, the, there's no real description of whether this Anidasana is somehow related to the, how does it relate to the five aggregates, where, you know, what it, the Buddha doesn't describe. And it's probably because, as the description in the suttas, there's these things that when one tries to think about them are like a wilderness of views, a thicket of views. Basically, one just thinks about them and they just lead on to more thinking. <laughs> they don't come to an end. So in this uh, discussion with Ajahn Chah, he was descri- they were asking him, is, is the primal mind uh, the same as the knower? And he's like, no, they're different. And it's kind of, uh, basically, he says, he says well, everybody has a knower, and you know, it's going on like this. And then there's, the person is kind of asking more and more questions about this kind of primal mind and the knower, and you know, there's maybe questions coming up about the relationship between the two. And then at the end, Ajahn Chah says, uh, you know, things don't come to an end this way. They only get more complicated. <laughs> it's basically through practicing the Buddha's teachings, things become less and less, uh, more and more, uh, become more and more narrow, one could say, not more and more broad, more and more narrow. One is narrowing down uh, one's defilements more and more until one uh, can reach the deathless. And if one reaches the deathless, this is one one will be able to know for oneself what the Kruba Ajans, what the Buddha was talking about. But at least in the suttas and from the description of the Kruba Ajans, one doesn't necessarily need to see this as a, as a big difference. It's kind of the way that they describe it as a type of consciousness. The Buddha also uses metaphors for a type of consciousness, but they also say it's something beyond description. Even saying that the knower is basically a vijja. That's kind of <laughs> consciousness, normal consciousness is basically a vijja. The one who knows just this awareness is a vijja. Sometimes this, is, uh, uh, this kind of uh, language may be used or may be interpreted. So, um, so again, one can basically take the suttas and use them to interpret what the Thai Kruba Anjans are saying. There was also uh, in the biography of Ajahn Man, uh, there's a time when he's still, uh, still basically practicing, and he has this dream where he uh, he goes up to he cro- he, a number of things happen, but he ends up coming up to a tapitaka cabinet, and he can't he can only look at the tapitaka cabinet, he can't open it and admire it to its heart's content. And so the interpretation of that dream is that Ajahn Man, who along with Venerable Ajahn Sao, was the founder of the Thai forest tradition, he would have enough skill to basically be able to elucidate the path, you know, to a certain level, but could not reach the skill level of, uh, of the Buddha. And so uh, some of the language that the Kruba Ajans use, after, they're, talking from ex- they're talking from their experience. And uh, the Buddha's language is extremely, extremely scientific, extremely, extremely precise, and basically nobody can match him. So what one can do if one has faith in the Kruba Ajans, wants to practice in the Thai forest tradition, is basically one can interpret their what they're saying through the lens of the suttas. And there's not really a disjunction there. So those are a few thoughts on those two issues, uh, especially the issues of samadhi and the issues of uh, the Kruba Ajans describing um, uh, a kind of uh, a knower, uh, or describing the uh, Nibbana as a kind of consciousness. So I hope that uh, might be useful for those who uh, are interested uh, in practicing following the footsteps of the Kruba Ajans, or maybe those who are just generally interested. <laughs> so wishing everybody all the, du- all the blessings of Dhamma practice, and bye for now.